welcome to the Scholar Circle, scholarcircle.org. I'm Maria Armudian. Can international finance systems be harnessed to protect human rights? While historically, financiers have funded some of the worst human rights abuses, finance has also enabled great human leaps. Our next guest argues that it's time to alter the financial system for the good of humanity. David Kinley is professor and chair in human rights law at the University of Sydney Law School. He's the author of Necessary Evil, How to Fix Finance by Saving Human Rights and Civilizing Globalization, Human Rights and the Global Economy. He's also the co-editor of Human Rights, Old Problems, New Possibilities. Welcome to the Scholar Circle, David Kinley. It's great to have you here. I thought perhaps we could start with the premise of your argument that finance is a fundamental part of life now, but that it has also become what you called, I like this phrase, a menacing fiend. What are the aspects that you are calling menacing? How menacing are they and for whom? Well, I think just on your first point, it really has provided huge benefits for humanity as a whole. If you look at the poverty rates globally from 1980 to today, there's been a precipitous drop of people living in abject poverty, particularly in places like China, but across the world. But the fact is that a consequence of that of that drop in poverty has been enormous increases for a certain privileged sector of societies across the world in rich and in poor countries. That is actually the essence of so much of the menace that's in finance, because humankind, I think, responds well to being given more and having a more comfortable, secure, respectful, dignified life. But when humankind, uh, us as individuals, look across the pitch and we see somebody doing better and indeed doing a lot better and continuing to do a lot better, there's that human impulse of is that fair? Is that appropriate? And I think it's not greed. Some of it might be, but I think it's much more about that question of equity and fairness uh, that exists within humanity, particularly those who have got beyond uh, the point where they have to worry about how much food they put in their mouths, whether they have shelter or not. So I think the menace, and I'm talking here about menace in poor countries, as well as menace between the middle class and the uber rich in rich countries, it resides in that notion of inequity in the way finance conducts itself. And I think part of what you're alluding to is that this is all contextual in that the more the neighbor gets, the more the other neighbor wants. And so it can end up being really a race for, you know, bigger, better, more sexier, that ultimately can be a problem for a small planet. Why? Yes, <laughs> your last two words are important. I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, just rolling it back a bit, one of the most interesting things that I find in, in interviewing some of the um, financiers, particularly the big uh, men and women of uh, Wall Street and, and the London Square Mile, was not so much that they felt they were not getting enough pay and remuneration and bonuses. They were. They accepted that. But what really drove them was whether they were getting more than their neighbor. And that's what the competition was about. It was not whether it was 5 million or 50 million. It was whether if it was more than the person that they were working beside, their direct competitor. That's a sort of uber example of what I'm talking about in people's uh, looking across the ditch. But finance was driving that and was feeding off that. And, And it did actually you know, instill in us a degree of that need to get ahead. The financialization of everything is now something that we're quite used to. You know, we let out our homes, our cars have become sort of taxis. And so this is the sort of thing that we now see as being part of our life. Uh, Everything can be put into dollar terms. I want to get to that point a little bit later, too, because you even noted, you know, our anxieties are even monetized to some degree, that everything has become monetized, which could be a major sort of morality flaw in and of itself that might be inherent to the system. Yes, if the system gets its way, because finance is about money and about finance, (laughs) manifestly. But that doesn't mean that the rest of society has to be captured by all that finance is concerned with. We're, we're concerned with aspects of our lives in different ways at different times of the day, whether it's our health, our, our job, our intellect, or our, our financial circumstance. So it is with the economy, so it is with society. But I think that the power of finance has risen to such an extent over the last 30, 35 years 
that it has swamped so much else. And in, in particular, it swamped the way in which our governments think. Yeah, uh, let's talk about it, that a bit. I think that is key. I, I'm a political scientist, so of course I see that. But I also saw it when I was a practitioner working in a government where what the financier said was essentially the law. You had a very difficult time putting forward legislation kind of along the lines of what it sounds like you're proposing in your book without the bankers killing it. Yes. And why do we think that that's the case? Well, I'm sure you were, you're a political scientist. You worked that out very quickly. The economists, the policymakers, the regulators, and of course, the politicians themselves realize that finance is absolutely critical to their bottom line, and they are judged by their electorates by the bottom line. But what's more, the health of the financial sector is also um, umbilically linked to the bottom line of us, the electorate, the individuals. And so we're very sensitive to the fact that if the politicians are seen to do something that the financiers tell us or we see as being something that curbs risk, maybe for a long-term objective, but shortens our profits in the short term, we feel concerned and maybe are not that well disposed towards the politicians. So you get tied up in the whole race yourself. And I think the financiers realize that because although, as I emphasize in the book, greed is writ large, uh, it's an article of faith within finance itself, it is also part of the way our, our society operates. I mean, I would suggest... Um, when I've been doing talks like this, I always say this to the audience. I, I would suggest that the, the, the sorts of debt that you have, the people in, your, in, in one's audience, is, are, is astronomical compared to what their grandparents had, even their parents. Uh, and their parents and grandparents wouldn't countenance taking on this sort of debt. But we do today. We, we are much more leveraged up. We are much more willing to see finances being a way forward. And, and it can be for those who were already in a fortunate enough position, but not everyone. <laughs> well, let's talk a bit about how we got here to this point. You argued that finance has become a little bit like Frankenstein, like it developed a life of its own. How did this happen? Right at the beginning of the, of, of the research, one of the things I was looking for was how long have we had this sort of uh, race to the top uh, within finance? How long have we paid financiers more than CEOs of other uh, industry sectors. And I came across this great quote from John Maynard Keynes in Between the Wars, in which he said, how long are we going to continue to pay the men, as it was, the, the men of the City of London, these extortionate salaries? And I thought, well, there you go. It's 100 years we've had this. But in fact, after the Great Depression, uh, after the Wall Street crash in the 30s, there was a precipitous drop in the way in which finance was seen by society. Uh, there was a lot of bloodletting within the financial sector and uh, CEOs in banks dropped right down to the same level as every other uh, industry sector. They became boring, which was fine, but not as spectacular as it had been before. But then with the rise of free market economics, uh, particularly Reagan and Thatcher, the so-called big bang within Wall Street and the city of London, where leverage and opportunities uh, within finance were uh, created by a deregulatory environment. From the 80s onwards, you have this enormous buildup of the capacity, the inventiveness, uh, the exotic dimensions of finance, which allowed the balloon to grow ever, ever bigger. And it wasn't until 2008, really, that we saw a global burst of that. We saw little bits with savings and loan and others, but it was really 2008 that showed how dangerous this balloon can be when it's allowed to inflate that big. It's actually tied to how Wall Street functions in a way, right? You have to keep growing in order to justify rising share prices. So it seems like that growth is part of the fundamental problem and that need to grow. Growth is part of the capitalist system, the free market economic system, outside finance as well as inside the financial sector. But I think what's peculiar about finance, because of the big bang from the 80s onwards, so much of it has become about extracting value from your financial investment rather than creating it. So in other words, the sector itself can feed off its own exercises rather than feeding into the real economy. So it's actually not that aspect that's linked to trying to create companies that are able to build better iPhones or better bridges. But it's more the fact that you're able to make huge amounts of money by betting and a high frequency trading and leveraging your investments in speculative stocks. That's the aspect that allows the financial system to feed off itself, as it were. And that's the bit that's so dangerous, because it's not, as it were, creating 
a real economic output. It's just creating more value for those who put in the investments in the um, in the financial sector itself. So let's set that slightly to the side for a moment and then look at this other side, which is what you are trying to do in the book, which is to argue that, yes, we know finance is creating massive problems, but that it has also created a lot of good. You actually went so far as saying that a very serious proportion of human advancements were also resulting from finance. So let's talk about this good part, particularly on human rights. Again, as you pointed out, violations of human rights we know were financed and continue to be financed, whether it was the Holocaust or whether it's Congo. So there can be a huge disconnect, but you're arguing it can also be joined. How can you do that? Well, I think they are joined both in ways, finance and human rights, both in ways that are good and bad. You're quite right. I do quote some other authors who say that at the center of nearly every major human advancement, there has been a financial dimension. I think that's the only cause, but certainly it's been there. And one of the reasons for that is because human rights in everyday terms, like our security, our safety, our welfare, our education, the levels of respect that we're able and should uh, provide to each other and obtain ourselves, all of these things are based on our individual capacity to be able to secure a safe, commodious, thriving lifestyle. That's for ourselves. Now, if we can't do that, the state provides it, or the state provides the environment in which we can do that. So finance is key to the way in which we live a comfortable life, the good life, however you want to have phrased it. Um, but finance can also, because of its the pursuit of greater wealth, can also create enormous problems, as you rightly mentioned, with respect to, say, uh, the Congo. Uh, and many other uh, commercial-driven uh, examples of that. And that's where I think one needs to focus more on how human rights are a casualty of what finance does. And at the moment, the human rights world, the, particularly the academy, on the, uh, the human rights side do not engage with finance for many reasons. Historically, it's seen as sort of dirty lucre, filthy, don't touch it, we don't get involved in that sort of stuff. It's also extremely complex difficult to understand where the lines of cause and effect are. Um, and also there's been a real history of loggerheads, of a, of a gap in understanding and trust between the two. Uh, and the, the same is true on the finance side. Finance simply sees itself as something that is concerned with making the financial pie bigger. They don't have to look or concern themselves with the distribution of the financial uh, largesse. That's the politicians, policymakers, other people's concern. And so you've got this disconnect, as, as you mentioned. And I see, I saw at the beginning of the book 10 years ago, and still today, this need, and it's, it's almost as strong a need today as it was 10 years ago, to bridge that gap, um, to have both sides recognize the importance of the other, rather than seeing it as somehow the enemy. And in recognizing, trying to understand each other and bridge the divide. Let's talk about how we do that. So one thing that you said early out in the book is that there are two primary obstacles in finance that prevent this sort of doing good. So narcissism, you said, and financial exceptionalism. How does this fit in finance? The narcissistic dimension uh, is really the idea that we look after ourselves. Uh, nobody else needs to concern themselves with what we do. Whatever we say uh, is good for finance must be good for finance and uh, ergo good for the rest of the economy. The exceptionalism comes from the fact that because we are such an important sector, the financial sector argues, because we have yielded so much of the benefits uh, uh, and, of course, taken our uh, pound of flesh at the same time, but the fact that we've yielded so many benefits means that you should have a hands-off attitude towards us. Allow us uh, this long leash, allow the deregulation, allow us to pursue these exotic ways of making money because ultimately everyone will benefit. Uh, we may benefit very largely, but everyone will benefit. And I think that level of exceptionalism has become such that it's mesmerized us as electorate and it's mesmerized our leaders. And we don't dare uh, touch finance. I mean, I think one of the most extraordinary things here, 10 years, almost exactly 10 years uh, anniversary since Lehman Brothers disappeared down the gurgler, 
is how little has actually changed between 2008 and 2018. There have been some changes for sure in the banking sector. They've now got greater levels of equity than they had before. Huge conflicts of interest, the really egregious ones have been removed. Um, and it is slightly, but only slightly less profitable. But how many bankers went to jail for the sorts of activities that occurred? Um, how many banks were actually prosecuted? Many of them were prosecutions were sought, but settlements were arranged rather than convictions recorded. And so in a way, people look at this, and despite all of that, bankers' remuneration and bonuses have gone right back to where they were in 2007. So despite all of this, the people who are in sort of the middle and low tiers, which is the vast majority of us, uh, of society, look at the top tier, those who have benefited from finance, and say, well, how come even the, the financial crisis didn't chasten you? Uh, what do we need to do in order to see a greater equity, a greater division, a greater distribution of the largesse? Because that didn't work. So what is going to work? Let's see if we can answer that question. You argued that part of it, I love this quote, by the way, in your book, by redesigning the warped incentive structures through which esteem is won and lost inside the sector. So you're arguing that we need to change the incentives, change the mission. How do we do that? This is the long bow that I'm pulling here. <laughs> and I accept that uh, because I, 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 but you know, when I'm speaking to um, normal or, or audiences with normal people in it, <laughs> human rights people and finance people, it's surprising how people ex not accept this, but they, they, they understand that this is a, a, an idea worth pursuing because I, I'm conscious of myself thinking, uh, or I'm conscious of myself that this is producing something that may be too far ahead. But this idea of bankers having a notion of uh, social responsibility, of the esteem that they wish to be held in, is changeable. So at the moment, uh, even after the financial crisis, what is considered esteemful, what is considered worthy, is if you really are a hard-assed, uh, take-no-prisoners, jungle-oriented um, financier. Uh, but yet, does that have to be the case? Uh, um, I'm quoting some great philosophers, uh, uh, Philip Pettit and, and uh, Jeffrey Brennan, who, who've got this book called The Economy of Esteem, in which they identify all sorts of uh, um, um, examples of people having changed the way in which they uh, view certain things, like, for instance, um, looking after the environment, the idea that we would uh, that we would um, uh, segregate our rubbish uh, into plastics, bottles, and uh, and paper 15, 20 years ago would have seemed ridiculous. How, how is that going to change things? Yet now it's absolutely de rigueur. It's the way in which we conduct these things. Why can that not be the same with uh, our attitudes uh, within and to finance? So the argument here is a really long-term one. It's not going to happen quickly. But financiers have to accept that they can still make money. I'm not saying destroy finance, quite the reverse. I'm saying we've got to recapture it, re reconstruct it. Uh, but it has to be done in a way that has financiers recognizing the outside responsibilities, the outside consequences of their actions, rather than simply saying in a narcissistic way, in an exclusionary way, look, we're here just to make the pie as big as possible. Uh, forget everything else. Uh, leave us to that job and we'll do it well. That, I think, is not a responsible uh, attitude to take, particularly because of the political power and the social consequences that finance has. Uh, and I think there's a slow awakening there. You know, impact investing, even the big end of town are now uh, investing, uh, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, others, investing in the idea of impact investing, sustainable and uh, and socially aware uh, investing. It's small, but it's growing. Um, Larry Fink from BlackRock at the beginning of this year's letter to CEOs saying, look, you've got to have a social um, project. You've got to recognize what you give back to society as well as making a profit. And only then will we consider investing you. Th these are the sorts of signs one would hope in a change in the way of, uh, uh, in the measurement of how um, uh, finance recognizes esteem, how it, how it recognizes achievement. Well, I'm just going to play a little devil's advocate with you a little bit. So one of the thinkers that you cite in the book, of course, is Adam Smith. But you noted a part of Adam Smith's work that even when he was composing that book, even when he was writing that book, he was arguing that – 
financial system, the economic system, was really ultimately to help society. So it's not a new idea, right? No, not at all. Uh, in, uh, in, in fact, it's, it is really a reconstruction of what finance is for rather than a new construction. Uh, and that is what I tried try to argue. And I, I don't think one has to go all the way back 250 years to Smith either, but certainly you're right. Uh, particularly, Smith is particularly interesting, not just because he was such an extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary thinker, but, but, but because he is considered to be the doyen of free market capitalism. The invisible hand is the most quoted, the most understandable uh, feature of the Enlightenment to reach into our free market thinking today. And yet, that book, uh, which was written 25 years after he had written his first book, on the Theory of Moral Sentiments, that book was a, an effort in a search for a means by which he could uh, help those on the margins of society, the very people that he talked about in his first book, The, the Theory of Moral Sentiments, lamenting the fact that so many people lived in abject poverty and only a privileged few managed to live a life that was effectively worth living. So how could he help those on the margin of society? And that's where he hit upon the idea of a free market economy, that if the invisible hand, the, the individual bettering him or herself and enriching him or herself could at the same time be used in a way collectively to help the whole of society. That was his object, not to give free reign to the individual to take whatever he or she wants, but to do so in a way that would encourage them to enrich themselves, but at the same time to enrich the rest of society. That is precisely what Smith is about. But that part of Smith is too often overlooked or, for or forgotten. Right, which is, I think, what I wanted to kind of come full circle on. Frequently, the philosophies that have really noble goal in them get warped and people start to use them for their own selfish desires. And it seems that Smith's has also gone that way. While I agree with your sentiment, I'm wondering, are you being very idealistic in this? Yes, I am. Actually, I am. And um, I think human rights uh, people are always idealists. Well, I mean, how could you be anything else? Um, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. Uh, and indeed, you know, sticking the marker way out ahead of us is no bad thing. Um, I, I, and it, that is what Smith was doing. You know, with Smith, I'm not so sure that it's it's sheer skullduggery that um, sort of conniving attitudes towards what he said, just pick that and, and avoid the other bits. I think most people just simply don't read or indeed even want to read Smith. They just accept this idea that surely, isn't it not self-evident that if we pursue our own interests, then that's good for everyone because we'll be taxed. Uh, we'll be able to provide employment uh, we'll be buying and selling, so we'll, we'll um, in, invest in the economy. Well, yes, except that one of the major problems with all of that is that, is that people are able to avoid taxation. People are able to salt away their, uh, their, uh, their properly gotten gains as well as their ill-gotten gains. And what's more, a lot of this is um, legal. So uh, I spent a long time in the book making the distinction between avoiding tax and evading tax, one being legal, one being illegal. The fact is that now a lot of companies, a lot of rich individuals don't actually have to be illicit. They don't have to break the law. It's just that the way the tax system is created allows them, because they are rich, because they have a lot of capital, to, to pay less tax, sometimes very little tax, compared to others who don't. Uh, and the, so the system has been skewed to a point not just to encourage the individual to work hard for her gains, but actually to allow them to keep most of those gains and deny the very thing that Smith was after, which is some of it to be divested out to the rest of society. I think that's you know, a huge problem. I think I quote at one stage the fact that the, the, um, the US tax code is nearly 4 million words long. Now, why do you think it's 4 million words long? It's not for the benefit of the poor. It's there with all the loopholes for those who have income and wealth that can use those loopholes. It's not for the poor or for the middle class. And the tax lawyers are employed to understand the four million words. I mean, it's, it's almost a travesty. It's almost, as one person calls it, legal corruption. 
I can see that. And it seems like the legal system is the structural problem. But then how do you change the legal system if it is captured by the very actors that we're talking about? And I suppose that's the big question that I have here. Yeah, you're right. Um, You know, it's it's interesting at at the moment for me uh, with this book, because I think in the U.S., to an extent, Europe, the GFC has now gone through its machinations and it's now an interesting footnote, people looking back at it, but, you know, things have gone back t- to normal. And um, people have got other fish to fry and they're not focusing on the financial sector in the same way. So there's a sort of sense of, phew, we got away with that, let's move on. Um, and things won't change. Um, what are the signs that they, that they might? Well, as I said, oddly for me, although I'm originally uh, Irish, European, here I am, in Australia, and we're just going through, as is often the case, the late stages of some of that GFC, which uh, we have a big banking inquiry at the moment, uh, uh, which you may be aware of, um, that's focusing on the skullduggery of, of our banks, which is extraordinary in its hubris, in the way it just seemed to care little about what clients and customers were doing. And it might yield some sort of long-term uh, change in the attitudes and perspectives of the way the banking system is run, maybe even legally and structurally. Uh, I'm not suggesting that Australia will then lead the world in all of this, but it might create some sort of movement uh, for change. What are the other sides outside? um, Well, some of them, I think, are not directly related to finance and yet may shake up the system. I mean, I would suggest that that um, disenchantment with the way in which society has dealt their hand um, for many people is evidenced in... uh, renegade democratic results. Obviously, the Trump administration in the United States, Brexit in the UK. So in other words, it's sort of blow up the system because the system really isn't doing anything for us. GFC, the global financial crisis, didn't blow it up. So to hell with it. Let's just vote in somebody who really will shake it up, whether we think they will actually help us or not. It doesn't matter. We'll just blow up the system. And I think there's an element uh, of that. Now, I'm not suggesting that will necessarily lead to a restructuring in finance. But, you know, taking the, the lines of uh, Thomas Piketty uh, in his uh, Capital book, these sorts of huge differentiations uh, in equality and, and wealth cannot go without consequences. And those consequences will be voiced in all sorts of maybe sometimes unpredictable ways, including political. And I just don't think that, that um, finance can afford to go back to a sort of comfortable position where it felt it was before the crisis. Uh, and maybe there will be another crisis around the corner. There's whisperings of that uh, around the globe at the moment. It may be situated in different places, maybe in China with its enormous debts uh, that it's holding, and those might explode. But whatever, uh, what will happen then? Will there be a bailout then? Will the governments be able to deal with that in relatively short time after the previous uh, um, uh, financial crisis? I don't know. I, so it may be that it's a crisis-oriented change, that with crisis will come change or multiple crises will come change. But in any case, for me, I'm suggesting, look, this is the way it should go. The human rights has got to be more engaged in what finance does to understand finance. Finance has got to more, uh, be more recognizing, more accepting of its social consequences, of its, uh, of its social responsibilities. And that will be a slow, slow road, I, I suggest, uh, with or without crises. Well, thank you so much for being with us. It's been a great pleasure hosting you. The book, again, is called Necessary Evil. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for having me on the show. David Kinley is professor and chair in human rights law at the University of Sydney Law School. He's the author of Necessary Evil, How to Fix Finance by Saving Human Rights and Civilizing Globalization, Human Rights and the Global Economy. He's also the co-editor of Human Rights, Old Problems, New Possibilities.